two. Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and WNST.net. Still baseball season around here, and I've had some friends visiting. and Didn't do a whole lot of baseball talk around here in July, but into August, the Kansas City Royals came to town. We heard from Jeff Montgomery a little earlier. We're going to hear from Steve Stewart now, who is uh, not only my Facebook friend and a one-time Baltimore on who escaped for the big parades of the big blue in Kansas City, uh, but, uh, dude, I love that you still have the picture of you in uh, and the trophy on the front of your Facebook. And I love that your family got together here in Baltimore. And you love Baltimore more than most of these road trips, don't you? You know, it is funny, Nestor, because I've lived in a lot of places. Um, but, uh, you know, Baltimore stays with you. It really it sounds corny, but it really does. It's a great place. The people are just outstanding. And a lot of people, as you know, I wasn't fortunate enough to stay here my whole career because I moved around. But I loved it here, and so many people, once they get here, they never leave, and any of us who have ever lived here understand why that is. Well, you've seen the emptiness. I, you know, I don't know how low it can go or how few people can show up. I, you know, you, you've got a great vantage point for baseball in every city and lonely places, empty places. You go to Tampa and Oakland as well. Uh, uh, Kansas City's not doing so well right now. It's very easy to say, well, when you win, people come, and when you don't, but not everybody can win. I'm worried about baseball, Steve, and, and you know, you've made your living through it. I used to make my living talking about I don't make my living at all about baseball anymore. There's no money to be made in baseball uh, in sports radio in Baltimore uh, because there's not really much to talk about. And then the Olesker story happened last week about the future of the franchise, and I think everybody here should be thinking about the future of the franchise. I'm not naive enough to think that what you portrayed you know, in your picture is the start of the baseball game, that whatever three or 4,000 people that are showing up, I don't feel like this is sustainable long-term, Steve. You know, I uh, I know you're a big hockey fan, uh, as am I, and Gary Bettman, the commissioner of the NHL, really, really, really got it right when he would not relent. This is now, we're talking, what, almost 20 years ago, until they got a hard cap and a hard floor and they made hockey even Steven. So the Rangers and the Canadians are the equivalent of the, and the Toronto Maple Leafs are like the Yankees, the Red Sox, and the Dodgers. They don't really have any advantages to speak of over the smaller cities that might have a million people like Calgary or a city like Columbus or, or Nashville. And that league is unbelievable because everybody's in it right up until the end. You know, and it's the rules are the same for everybody. And, you know, the NFL, of course, has had a cap forever. NBA was the first league to start it. And, you know, it saved the league. That league, you talk about baseball having problems. It is a $10 billion industry. And even with all the problems, at least the teams aren't going under by any means because there's a lot of money in the game with baseball. But the fairness aspect has, has, has really, I think, the other leagues, the other three leagues have shown that, and it would take a lot for baseball to get there. And I, you know, it might take a, a stoppage and it might take a long one. But, you know, which we tried in 94, couldn't get it done. That was the goal in 94 during the strike. It was probably mishandled and there were some things that got in the way. But if you could have hockey system of all the four major sports, it would be unbelievable. The Yankees would have virtually no advantage over the Orioles. The Red Sox would have virtually no advantages over the Rays or the Orioles. It wouldn't be the easiest thing in the world. But in the end, all the players especially the average to the, the non-stars and the young players would all make more money. The superstars might get curtailed a little bit or whatever, but to me that's the way to save the game. And I mean, there, there are rule changes speeding up the game and certain things you can do to, to you know, try to make the game a little more, you know, put more action into it. I know we got the three two out, true outcomes and we have a lot of too many home runs and too many strikeouts and walks and not enough contact, ball not being put in play enough. But I really am a fan. Now, having said all of this, how did Houston become a juggernaut? They did exactly what the Orioles are doing right now. And I know folks get tired of hearing that because in, in real time, the moment, it's hard to see that. But when you, used, when you went to Houston, I went there when they were a runaway freight trade in the National League, drawn $3 million a year with Clemens and Pettit, Roy Oswalt in the rotation, going to the playoffs every year. And then I went when they decided it was time to rebuild. And they got rid of everybody. They dropped their payroll to $25 million. They lost a, over 100 a year, three years in a row. And then the fourth year, they lost something like 97. They got top draft picks. 
They took a lot of good players. They scoured the earth, but a lot of high picks they hit on, you know, an Alex Bregman and a Carlos Correa and, and Jose Altuve they found actually early in that build. And, and now they're this runaway freight train. And Cubs did the same thing. We did the same thing. We were bad for a long time. Ours wasn't quite as intentional as what the Cubs and Astros and what the Orioles are doing right now and what we're doing now. But that in this game, because it takes so long to grow your own, you don't do it overnight. And that's what the Orioles are doing. They got the right people in charge to do it. You know, you never know for sure how the outcome's going to be, but they got the right people in charge who've done it before. Uh, and, you know, Mike Elias was with Jeff Luno in St. Louis, went with Luno to Houston. St. Louis has never quite been the same. They're still good, don't get me wrong, but they haven't quite been as productive making great players out of their farm system as they were in the days they had Luno and Elias in St. Louis. And Obviously, we see what Houston's done. So that's what they're trying to do here. The problem is the ugliness. When Houston was down at the bottom before this incredible run, I would go in there having seen it with 3 million people, just like I've seen 3 million people here in Baltimore before. And you'd go in, and for those few years, it almost felt like uh, going into an old house that was no longer occupied. Oh, I remember the Bo Porter just, era. I, you know, I do. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. That, that's what you saw. And that's a little bit what the Orioles have going on now and we have going on in Kansas City right now. And obviously, you know, we have, you know, we have a lot of, good players and the minors that we're high on and you know it, it's it's a difficult process but it's it's the only way to make it work unless you're going to take your payroll to 210 million and only three or four teams of baseball do that and even then even the yankees had to they did a very quick rebuild like give them credit i mean their rebuild was like in about six months and they you know they their rebuild they was four trades moves. right literally <laughs> right yeah it was it was tough so it's it's very difficult but I, and we all worry about the game because we love this game and we all know what a great sport, what a great game it is. It's really the greatest game in the world. It's amazing. Um, but boy, oh boy, would I love to see that cap floor system. And I think any Oriole fan right now would sign up for that too. Steve Stewart is our guest, a one-time Baltimorean now calling all things Kansas City Royals. And uh, you, how many, 12 years, how long you been out there? Yeah, my 12th year here. Time flies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many years in Baltimore? Uh, four. Four. Four wonderful years, yeah. Well, it wasn't wonderful the on the field during those years, as I remember. No, so but you know what? It was it was a lot of fun, and it was a great chance to uh, to cover big league baseball and work with some great people, and uh, so and, and and cover everything. Cover the Ravens' first Super Bowl championship. Cover the Terps' NCAA basketball championship. Cover the Terps' football team going to bowl games every year. Man, I mean, you were here during a really were, nice time, man. That, I, I really know, was. Yeah, it was fantastic. And getting to go to the White House uh, when. When Maryland won the title, I mean that was really fun. So yeah, it was a uh, even if none of them had been winning, it still would have been a great time here. But it was uh, that made it really special. Steve, I mean, you go to all these stadiums and you go to these places where baseball matters a lot, where it used to matter, where it's never mattered, quite frankly. And Kansas City and Baltimore are sort of paralleled in the George Brett, Earl Weaver, Jim Palmer. You know, it mattered when we were much younger in the modern era, 29 years without a playoff appearance in Kansas City. The Orioles have been the disaster that they've been most of the time. And, you know, I look at like a St. Louis or the, the Cubs or the Red Sox, these sort of venerable franchises where St. Louis has tried to build a downtown or, uh, around the Cardinals. I don't know how that has worked. But for what the stadia are, for what the negotiating is going to be, the Orioles deal's up in two years, right? So it's been 30 years, and they're going to negotiate. And they're negotiating from a place where obviously nobody's at the games. We have crime issues here. We have leadership. We have a lot of issues here. I live downtown. I, I see it and feel it and talk about it in Baltimore Positive every day. But Kansas City won won a championship, delivered on all of that, and the people aren't going there either. I, I just wonder what happens to build something venerable where the Cubs lost for 100 years, the Red Sox lost for 100 years, and people cared and it mattered and it stayed. Uh, and, and the Cardinals win a lot, so they're probably, you know, they've had this venerable 50-year, 60-year brand, whatever it is, um, of doing it for that long across a huge footprint. I just thought the Royals and the Orioles, that there used to be more of a halo after you go to ALCSs and you give the fans a nice product and you give them some Machado and some Jones and some Buck and you, you give them some uh, some uh, Moustakis and some Hosmer and some Kane, you know, and a championship. It just feels like in the old days maybe more people would hang on, but it's very, very quick to say I'm not going to a baseball game anymore when things go bad. And maybe that's human nature. Maybe that's where we are. 
But th- th- that's really one of the things that's bothered me is even in the Pittsburgh, Kansas City, and Baltimore where they won a little bit, it doesn't feel like it's mattered on the back end that they've really built their business, you know? Yeah, it's it's tough. And, you know, in, in, the, in the days that we remember when we were growing up, remember that free agency really didn't get here till 75. And other than the Yankees, teams weren't really buying into, no pun intended, into free agency until more into the 80s. And so, t- you know, the Courier team stayed around longer. You know, in our case, Well, I did window... wake up as an Oriole fan one day and half my team was in Anaheim, but that's another... <laughs> no, exactly. It was a different world. But, like, for instance, uh, you know, in our case, you know, we, we built a core, and all of them, almost all of them, came up at 11. And, and so they were here all of 12, learning, losing, hard lessons. All of 13, when... You know, uh, George Brett had to take over as sort of their hitting coach slash confidence coach when a lot of guys weren't hitting yet. And then 14, even in 14, when they when they went to the World Series, um, you know, it was the first half. There were a lot of ups and downs, and then they took off in the second half. So, it, you know, the, the tough thing is if you have control of guys for six years or maybe six and three-quarter years, depending on when a guy comes to the big leagues, you know, it can take – it can take two or three years for guys to really <clears throat> lock in and learn what it takes up here to win. So then the Royals, you know, obviously they, they go to the World Series 14. They win it in 15. That was a magical year. And then 16, 17, we had most of that core with us, but injuries and the wear and tear of two long postseasons and whatever else gets in the way, and, you know, it, it never goes exactly according to script. They were still competing to be in the postseason those years and just – fell short, ran out of gas. And, and selling a lot 17, of tickets, that, and, and people cared, and after, right? And they did, and they did. And after 17, that core left. And so, you know, it's sort of, I think what it is, there's a combination of so many things. You know, every game's in HD on television, and so you can still follow, and every, of course, radio and, and all the digital platforms, so you can still follow everything really closely without being at the park. The tough thing is trying to trying to monetize that beyond the subscriptions and get people into the park when you're not winning. And I agree with that. But again, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, that they've done some things. I mean, in 02, when they, when they started the revenue sharing and they had a, you know, luxury tax, they, they did on the edges on the margins, they did a little bit to tweak it and try to make it more fair. But I really think they got to go further. And I think the players would be better off because if only eight or 10 teams are just, you know, a roaring success every night and two thirds of the teams, you know, are, are kind of in and out of it. It's, you know, the sport isn't nearly as good and the players aren't going to make as much money. So we'll see what happens in a couple of years. I know the, the war, the war chants are coming up from the players union about things, or at least the whispers of it. And, and, and uh, you know what? I mean, I, I just want to see the sport put in a place where, where every city, I mean, this is a great, Baltimore is a great sports town and it's a great, baseball city and it, and it and it always will be even when times are down like now I mean, those fans didn't go anywhere they're out there they're paying attention they may not be in the seats every night but they know what the Orioles are doing they're following it and when when this group it's going to be a while but when they're ready two couple of years from now whatever they'll be coming back and they got a beautiful ballpark and i know the i know the challenges but the you know there's there's not a better place to come than Oriole Park and Camden Yards, so they'll well, be back. Yeah, that's why we talk about the future of the franchise. You say they'll be back. You say they'll win. I, I'm not sure where the businesses are, Steve. I mean, the, the Ravens have struggled with sponsorship and tickets and PSLs, and the, the market has shrunk. The leadership is, as you know, abysmal. Um, you know you know all about the riots. You know all the stuff that's happened here. Um, the The... The infusion of energy that needs to come from a business standpoint, from an ownership standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, with Peter on his deathbed and the kids not really running it. You know, did it not feel a little absentee to you just being for a couple? I mean, like, it it feels like a really hollow place right now. And I know that with 110 losses, that's one thing. But I'm talking about every other thing other than the games themselves, you know? Yeah, I'm telling you, it's... There's, there's still more atmosphere in that place, probably twice as much as there was in Houston in those Bo Porter years you're talking about. And it's nothing to do with Bo Porter. I mean, he had nothing to, nothing to work with. He, was a, he did a great job with, 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 lesser, with no talent on his team. They were payroll with that. They got rid of everything. They, they got rid of everything that wasn't nailed down. And they said, now they had a couple of advantages when Houston rebuilt. Let's remember a couple of things. They were invisible for about three or four years. They weren't on television. They had a bad, they tried their own TV network. Nobody saw it. 
So they were nobody could watch them, which you could argue they were unwatchable. So they were off TV for three or four years. And they had just moved to the American League, which was incredibly unpopular in that city, which had been an NL city for 50 years. But they, they got a big discount, and baseball sort of shifted them over to the American League to put it 15-15. And so they did have those little advantages. Now and, they love the, kicking the Rangers' what, ass. <laughs> right. And that, yeah. And, and, and so they, when I would go in there, it made Camden Yards, what I saw this last series with Baltimore, it made – you know, can the current Cannon Yards of 2019 look like, you know, the, you know, Oriole magic was back. I mean, that's how dead it was in Houston. Then now you go there, it's 42,000 and it's insane and it's crazy. And, and they have this incredible young team that just keeps cranking out. And you got the guy that helped build it there. I mean, they, you know, the, 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 the Orioles hired the right people. Now you never know a hundred percent how it's going to go. It's like a laboratory. You got to see how the experiment turns out. But you, I don't think you could have gotten better people to run the front office and, and run the field staff. And so the problem is, you know, it's the big leagues, and you still got to get through 162 games a year of, of, of being patient while it's being built. And that's frustrating. And, and, and Kansas City's going through the same thing. And a lot of fans in Kansas City are saying what a lot of fans of Baltimore are saying. They're glad football's here. <laughs> have something else to to pay attention to right now, but there, that love does not go away for the franchise. Well, the Mahomes factor is real, right? It's in your, it's in your DNA once you got it. Yeah. Obviously Mahomes is a, 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 a superstar in the league and a, and a wonderful story. You know, the, you know, the, the Royals went 30 years without a championship, which is long and it isn't. I mean, the Indians are 71 years now and so forth, but the chiefs are coming up on 50 years since their last Super Bowl appearance and Super Bowl victory. It'll be 50 years this coming January. Uh, will they finally break that hex to just to get back to a Super Bowl? So uh, it's hard to win in every sport, but in this sport in baseball, where the where the the rules are stacked against the teams that aren't you know that don't have aren't in markets with ten plus million people, it, it's tough. But it can be done, and it's been shown that it can be done. And unfortunately, you know, it's like the old Heinz commercial, you know, anticipation. You know, it's it's hard. It's hard to wait, but you just got to enjoy the young guys as they come up and and kind of grow with them. It's kind of a nightly soap opera. How's this young guy going to do? How's that young guy going to do? And, you know, you hope eventually that, you know, it turns into a great recipe for success. Smell those crab cakes. It's uh, Steve Stewart. He's back home with the family in Baltimore doing his thing here all week as the Royals have been visiting. Hey, last thing for you, because I know you love hockey. So I'm out at the Stanley Cup Finals last year. It's 114 degrees. I'm out in Vegas. And it's game, I don't know, game two, three, I don't know. They, they all run together. And uh, I'm underneath the bowl of the uh, of the, the hockey rink where it's chilly and I got my sport coat on and whatnot. And I'm walking around and a guy gets by me in the underneath and I looked up, and it looked like George Brett. It felt like George Brett. He went by me, and I'm like, that's George Brett. I'm like, yeah. hey, George Brett. He turned around, and he, he fist bumped me, and I'm like, I didn't take a selfie or bother him. I, I, I don't, I, the only selfie I have with George Brett is the one with the statue out in center field at, at, at Kaufman, you know. Um, and I've had George on the show, and I actually played it in July. But George Brett was my favorite player. It's the only bobblehead, uh-huh. baseball bobblehead I have is a Brett bobblehead. But seeing him at a high, how's George Brett? That's the most important thing I want to learn in this conversation. Yeah, you know, uh, one of his sons, he has three sons, and one of them became a big Golden Knights fan, right, when they cranked up. And uh, so they kind of jumped on that bandwagon. And uh, he's doing great. He's doing great. He just turned sixty-five this year. So we're all getting older. No, he's you not know, it's, sixty-five. It's, it's you know he's our Brooks Robinson. He's our Stan Musial. And you know, being from St. Louis, you know, Stan was always around, and he was the living legend that would be around. And uh, you know, Stan sadly has passed. And I know Brooks is getting up there in years, but I know it, it, it appears that he's pretty good health. George is you know very healthy. He's always taking great care of himself. He's still a vice president with the team. He's still he still cares passionately about the team. He's not working in the office on a daily basis, but he's at most home games. In spring training, he's in uniform with that number five, which, by the way, that came from being a Brooks fan. But he's in uniform with that number five on his back every day in spring training, in uniform, hitting fungos, talking to the young guys. You know, 6 a.m., he's at the complex. So he's still very engaged and, 
and very involved. It's, it's a, he's a great resource. So, Steve, I've been doing this 27 years now, and this summer the Orioles were so bad, and I just need a little downtime. I didn't even vacation. I'm working on this Baltimore Positive mission of mine, and I found all of my old tapes, and I went through 27 years of audio tape, digital, dad, you know, mini disc, all this formats, right? And I, uh, I tried to find every Hall of Famer I ever interviewed. And you remember I was syndicated, turn of the century, yeah. Sporting News. So yeah. I interviewed all these kind of, like, and what really began was when Frank Robinson died, because Frank was always a little salty toward me and most everyone in the media, uh, but he did right. do a, 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 an interview with me, and when uh -huh. I found that, it sort of opened Pandora's box. I found an interview of me and George Brett, 15 minutes long, from the last year at Camden Yards. Uh, I think Alan McCallum or my ballpark guy got him on the phone. I set it up, and I found it, and I had listened to it in 22 years, 23, whatever it's been, right? And I found yeah. it, and I played it on the radio. So I did interview George Brett, and the weird part is i don't even remember it but i have evidence that's of funny it. well that means we're all getting old and we've all been at this a long time but uh he's he's fun to interview because he's so he's such an alpha male he's such a type a personality that he's always engaged and always interesting and always passionate in everything he does you know he's a great golfer he's out there all the time he's passionate about his kids he's passionate about kansas city He's, you know, he's just, and he's got a million, obviously, like a lot of these guys in his world, he's got a lot of friends everywhere. He's at the Hall of Fame every year for the induction, and, uh, and he, anyway, he's, he's just, a, he's a joy to be around. Good. I'm glad I made you talk about him because I ran that interview last month and he was my favorite baseball player and I didn't ask Monty about him. So there. Hey, man, we will see you for hey, barbecue. Monty played, you know? Monty played with him right at the end, of Mon uh, the end of George's career, early in Monty's career. They were teammates. So you know what? I found all my old bumpers from 1992, 93, 94. I've, oh, Bill, Bill Murray did a bumper for me. Ron Howard, John Stewart. I've had all these meatloaf, all these old bumpers. But, but Monty and I became friends at the 93 All-Star Game and he did a bumper for me. And on the bumper Bumpers. Hey, this is Jeff Montgomery. You're listening to Nestor, you know. And hey, George Brett really is a great guy. And so that was part of his bumper <laughs> back in 19. And I broke those out That's this summer funny. too. So hey, That's love funny. you, appreciate you. And uh, you know, you can't get a crab cake everywhere, but I can't get, get barbecue like I do in Kansas City. So I'm this coming is, for the, uh, the home show. So I'll be there in a few weeks. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, this is a great place, Nestor. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Kansas City, one of my favorite places. Makes me think of Fats Domino. And uh, I'll get back to the Jazz Museum. They're probably appreciated more in the uh, Negro Baseball uh, uh, Hall of Fame. I don't think it's called a Hall of Fame, though. It's called a library, I believe. But uh, I'll make sure I get corrected on that. Matter of fact, I'll bring those folks on. We'll talk about that next month as uh, we do the Pat Mahomes thing. Give me a chance to plug uh, some Hall of Fames that I dig. There you go. Baltimore Positive meets Kansas City Positive. There you have it. Nasty at WNST.net, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram. Streaming live on our Facebook as well as our YouTube WNSTV channel. We are WNST.net, am 50 1570 at WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking. Baltimore Sports.